Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Communities Talk About Preventing Fentanyl Use by Youth and Young Adults. Today's recording, well, today's call rather, will be recorded. We will be monitoring the chat, so if you have any questions for our panelists, please write them in the chat box at any time. And if you have a question that is specific to a panelist, please include their name so that we can, so that I can uh, send the message to share the message with them. Next slide, please. My name is Marion Pierce. I'm a public health analyst in the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. I'm also the lead for the Communities Talk to Prevent Alcohol and Other Drug Misuse Initiative. Please join me in welcoming our co my co-presenters. Captain Jennifer Fan is the Acting Director for SAMHSA Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. Next slide, please. Rich Lucy is from the US Drug Enforcement Administration or DEA and Beth Connolly from the Office of National Drug Control Policy or ONDCP. At this point, I'd like uh, our speakers to tell us a little bit about themselves and the work they do. Captain Fan, please start us off. Hi, thank you, Marianne. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for having me. Um, as Marion said, I am the Acting Director for the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention in SAMHSA. Uh, I've been in this role uh, for only a short time, uh, seven months, I believe, uh, but I've been at SAMHSA for quite a while, 14 years, since 2007, I, I think. Um, and in my uh, journey at SAMHSA, I started off uh, overseeing opioid treatment programs and working on prescription drug monitoring program. And at that time, I actually saw the, the uptick of prescription misuse, especially in opioids. And it's it's been a while and it's, it's evolved into uh, an epidemic, um, especially in regards to um, opioid overdose, the mortality part of it. And, and now here we are, it's changed in prescription drug misuse, but now we've added another layer and the impact of fentanyl that is um, either by itself through, through fake pills or that it is adulterated in um, the drug supply. It, it, it's quite, um, uh, it, it's, it, it's fascinating and yet terrifying to see how you know, it's evolved. So, um, with that, um, I am excited to actually work in prevention to help uh, to help work on these issues, uh, to discuss and figure a way to move forward and, and improve the situation. Uh, so thank you, Marion. Rich. Thanks, Marion. Uh, first, uh, I 
want to thank SAMHSA for inviting DEA to be part of this conversation. Uh, my name is Rich Lucy. I am one of the Senior Prevention Program Managers here in DEA's Community Outreach and Prevention Support section. Uh, my entire career, 32 years plus, has been at the government level. I started my career in uh, state government, my home state of New York. Uh, and uh, in 1999, I started my federal career at the US Department of Education in what was the Safe and Drug-Free Schools Program. And then in 2008, I joined uh, my colleagues on this call uh, at HHS at SAMHSA. Uh, where I was a special assistant to former CSAP director, Fran Harding. That's a name many of you might know. And then in 2016, DEA uh, recruited me to come uh, work here. Um, my entire career has been in the prevention space, particularly preventing alcohol and drug misuse among youth and young adults with a particular emphasis among college students. Uh, I am excited uh, watching the ticker of participants. We have almost 900 people currently on this call and I'm watching that number rapidly go up. So it's exciting. Um, but to, to quote Jen, it's also a bit terrifying um, because of the subject matter. And I know people are so hungry for the information that is out there about this particular drug. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to, to Beth for an introduction. Thank you, Rich, and thank you, SAMHSA, for giving um, the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy an opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, I'm the Assistant Director for Public Health here at ONDCP, which means I oversee uh, the implementation of the National Drug Control Strategy in the areas of prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery. Um, I've been here at ODCB for about a year and a half, and prior to that, I oversaw the substance use portfolio at the Pew Charitable Trust. And like Rich, um, early in my career, I served 30 years in the state of New Jersey and was the Commissioner of Human Services. And this was an incredibly important area um, to all of us um, at the uh, Department of Human Services in New Jersey. And I can say that in my uh, 35 plus years of working um, in the area of human services and public health that we've never seen such a dynamic or scary drug supply. And so I'm really happy that SAMHSA put together this webinar today and I look forward to speaking with you all during my turn. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you all uh, for those introductions. And also thank you to the people who joined us today. Uh, as, as Captain Fan and others mentioned, this is uh, a, a very exciting topic and lots of work to do. So uh, I'll do a few housekeeping uh, rule notes and some other things, and then we'll go on with the presentation. Learning objectives. So it, uh, we hope that you'll learn more about how synthetic uh, opioids are an emerging threat in the US, especially uh, for youth and young adults, and all and about the evidence-based prevention approaches and interventions from SAMHSA, the DEA, and ONDCP. Uh, before uh, we, uh, I will also would like to just give a quick overview of the Communities Talk program, which is run by SAMHSA to support community-based organizations, colleges, and universities statewide or state-based organizations in holding substance misuse prevention activities. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. These events raise awareness and educate communities about the harmful consequences of underage drinking, as well as, <clears throat> excuse me, misuse, as well as underage and problem drinking in youth and young adults. And it also encourages communities to take to mobilize and take evidence-based prevention actions. Next slide. And I'm, I'm trying to contain my excitement. I'm, I'm doing double duty here. I'm looking at all of the, the hellos and I'm excited about that. But going back to this slide, because we need to talk about this as well. Um, since Communities Talk began, thousands of community-based organizations colleges, universities, and, and organizations have hosted their own events. Uh, there are, there were, this year there were 500 stipends of $750 each. They were given out on a first come first serve basis. 
uh, Communities Talk has evolved where they now take place every year and another cycle will be will begin in January of 2024. The hope is that this will help communities carry momentum from in their prevention efforts from year to year. And we strongly urge organizations to continue their prevention work, even if they do not receive uh, a stipend. And very important, Communities Talk has expanded now to include conversations about substance misuse and prevention of substance use disorders, as opposed to mainly focusing on underage drinking as it did in previous years. Next slide, please. Uh, it wouldn't be one of, uh, uh, one of my webinar discussions if I didn't include some resources. So we have many great resources, including success stories from communities across the country. Please go to the website uh, to, to see some, um, maybe you'll see your community uh, highlighted in one of those success stories. Our prevention podcast series features participants from previous communities talk cycles. Uh, our learning series is for prevention professionals and our what's new articles uh, share information to help event planners uh, plan, host, and, and also evaluate their prevention efforts. And of course, you can see all of these resources at Stop alcoholabuse.gov backslash communities talk. Next slide, please. Uh, we have two campaigns that focus on prevention professionals and primary care providers. The first is on addressing substance misuse among transition age youth not in college. And the second is on promoting substance misuse screening with pediatric primary care providers. And to learn more about these tips and tools, again, please visit stopalcoholabuse.gov backslash communities talk and visit the uh, mini campaigns section. Now, this is where for me, it, uh, the rubber hits the road and it gets really exciting. Uh, we're going to hear uh, we will hear first from Captain Fan, and then Rich and Beth was, will bring us home, and then I will come back at the end to facilitate uh, uh, the, the Q&A portion. And again, if you have specific questions for a presenter, please include their name with the question so that I can um, uh, point that out for them. Captain Fan. Thank you. Uh Great. Um, yeah, I just want to um, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us, uh, taking your time out of your busy schedules to be with us. Um, I'm pleased to also welcome SAMHSA's federal partners from the Drug Enforcement Administration and White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. Uh, Rich, Beth, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us and sharing your insights and expertise with us today. So the opioid epidemic remains a top public health and safety issue for our country. And as the epidemic continues to evolve, we do face new challenges. Um, the growing availability of illicit fentanyl and now, um, as you heard, xylazine, um, which is also known as, as TRANK, um, adds this urgency to how we all feel. To get us started, we'll look at, the, at what the data is showing. In 2021, we lost over 108,000 people to drug overdose. Among young people, 14 to 28 years old, the number of overdose deaths rose 20% in one year. And data shows that counterfeit pills were present in nearly one of every four deaths. This increased risk of fatal overdose is linked to easy access to fentanyl-laced drugs, whether the pills are obtained from friends or family or purchased through social media contexts. Our young people are often unaware of the dangers of using these drugs. So what can you do to prevent overdose deaths? Uh, next slide, please. 
I'd like to highlight examples from SAMHSA funded programs that are addressing the opioid fentanyl epidemic. And I'll close by sharing available resources to help your prevention efforts. This example is from our Strategic Prevention Framework for Prescription Drugs uh, grant program. The grant is also known as uh, SPIFRX. Here, the Iowa State Department of Public Health is using a public messaging campaign to raise awareness about the harms associated with taking either prescribed medications or altered pills. Next slide, please. In this example, the Missouri State Department of Health and Senior Services is using these infographics to alert the public to the dangers of fentanyl. Public awareness alone doesn't change behavior, but it is an important first step to helping youth recognize potential dangers to their personal health. Campaigns can encourage parents and caregivers to be aware that fentanyl may be available to young people in their communities. Knowing this, adults can then educate themselves about the dangers of fentanyl and then take the time to talk to their kids about it to prevent harm from coming to them. Next slide, please. In one Native Connections grant, Fort Belknap Indian community has seen an increase in fentanyl use and overdose deaths in their community. To help their high school students, the community has been providing fentanyl and overdose education. Not only that, the schools are standing ready for potential overdose situations by having naloxone available. One of our, prevent, uh, one of our um, grantee recipients under the Preventing Prescription Drug Opioid Overdose Grants, uh, Missouri State Department of Mental Health, um, they've established uh, school nurse champions in their schools. Over 200 school nurses have been trained in overdose education and naloxone distribution and naloxone supplies are now available at the schools they serve. Next slide, please. These two examples show the power of community. Um, the Arizona Youth Partnership faced an alarming rise in fentanyl and counterfeit pill deaths. To help communities prevent and reverse overdoses, they created this toolkit that each community could customize to meet their specific messaging needs. The slide lists the topics they covered. And in Northern California, the Napa County of Education hosted two town hall sessions regarding fentanyl poisoning in partnership with the Napa Opioid Safety Coalition. Why were these public meetings important? By working together, the county strengthened its relationship with a community partner. Raising public awareness, knowing the facts about fentanyl is the first step. These town hall meetings provided potential life-saving information for families who may encounter dangerous fentanyl. Next slide, please. So here are um, selected prevention resources that we have that you might find helpful um, from left to right. And the first one um, provides five conversation goals to help you talk with your young person about the harms of substance use. Um, the next one in the middle, is the Opioid Overdose Prevention Toolkit, which has strategies for healthcare providers, communities, and local governments for developing practices and policies to help prevent opioid-related overdoses and deaths. Um, we are looking to revise um, this toolkit um, to provide uh, more updated information, um, but it is uh, on our website with, um, with good strategies in there. And then if you have concerns about your child's health, wellness, and well-being, um, the screen for success can help you better understand what's going on. Um, this is a 10-minute screener that will help uh, look for signs of elevated risk and help you find support to address their needs. Uh, the resources section will provide you with recommended support services that are available in your area at the, next, at the national level. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this uh, is a confidential and anonymous resource to find treatment services. It's findtreatment.gov. And next slide. Opioids, fentanyl, and xylazine are the emerging threat to public health today. Um, it's a challenge, but we do remain vigilant to identify new drug threats. Prevention remains one of our most effective tools to address the crisis and substance misuse problems overall. Take action to reduce risk factors at home, at school, at work, and in your communities, 
and continue to help your young person build resiliency skills to help them thrive. Together, each of us contributes to keeping our kids, family, friends, and communities healthy and safe. And next slide. I think, yeah, I believe this is my uh, last slide. Thank you for your time. Um, and now uh, I will hand it off to Rich for his presentation. Great, thank you, Jen, appreciate it. And uh, for all the attendees, uh, I'm pleased that uh, we've seen each other's slide decks just prior to this webinar. And it's nice to see that our messages are not duplicative, but I actually think they reinforce each other. So you're getting three different federal agencies all on the same page, which is great. Um, so I am gonna talk a little bit more about the dangers of fake pills, illicit fentanyl, and then uh, a bit more about DEA's One Pill Can Kill campaign uh, and what that is and how you can get involved and help. So um, on the next slide, uh, the drug overdose crisis, it's a clear and present public health, public safety, national security threat. Um, it is like no other drug threat, quite honestly. And like I said, I've been in this field about 33 years. Um, and it's, it's incredible how uh, pervasive right now this threat is. It cuts across all uh, socioeconomic, uh, all populations. I, I refer to it, not kiddingly, as an equal opportunity to destroyer, quite honestly. Um, we see it in all types of communities, all types of settings. And DEA is doing everything that we can to keep these dangerous and deadly drugs out of your community, but we do need your help. We need you to be educated about the dangers of today's drugs. And as I'll discuss, some of these drugs are so lethal that experimenting with them one time uh, can be deadly. And every day on this next slide, you'll see some of the sample news headlines from communities across the country. I'm sure you have seen headlines just like this in the communities in which you work, play, and live. Uh, and these are, again, just a, a small sampling of those headlines. On the next slide, uh, which is a graphic about the overdose deaths, we know, as, as Jen had said too, um, greater than 107,000 over the last year drug overdose deaths. About two thirds of those, the majority of them, uh, are from opioids, uh, primarily fentanyl, and about one third involve psychostimulants, uh, primarily methamphetamine, quite honestly. On the next slide, uh, you'll see another graphic in terms of the amount of fentanyl that DEA has seized. So in 2022, DEA seized more than 50.6 million fake pills, often laced with fentanyl. That's more than double the amount of fentanyl pills that were seized in 2021. Uh, again, that quantity is enough to kill every American in 2022. So what is a lethal amount of fentanyl? And if you haven't seen this next graphic, uh, I hope you'll be able to share it with others. This is approximately two milligrams of fentanyl, and this is what is considered to be a lethal dose. We know that fentanyl is about 50 times more potent than heroin. And the fentanyl that's driving this crisis isn't just sold in fake pills. Dealers are mixing fentanyl with other illicit drugs to make their product go further and to increase their product. So we are, you know, hearing about and it's using uh, these pills that fentanyl is being mixed with coke, with meth, with heroin, um, in addition to being pressed into these fake pills. So public safety alerts. Uh, in 2022, in November specifically, DEA issued a public safety alert to warn the public of a sharp national increase in the lethality of fentanyl-laced fake prescription pills. We do not issue these public safety alerts often. Um, as a matter of fact, prior to this alert in November of 2022, the last ones issued were a year ago, so fall of 2021, to warn the public about the alarming increase in lethality and availability of fake prescription pills containing fentanyl and meth. And then six years before that, it was to call attention to the dangers associated with fentanyl when it was first coming on the scene as a dangerous and deadly threat. And so these next few slides are some graphics for you. Um, this first one, this was the focus of the public safety alert that we issued in November, 2022. Um, and this is where you know, we had announced that today about six out of 10 DEA tested pills with fentanyl contain a potentially lethal dose. That is up from four out of 10 when 
uh, we issued a public safety alert in uh, September of 2021. So we're obviously going in the wrong direction, right? In terms of the amount of, of these fake pills with uh, fentanyl, uh, lethal dose of fentanyl in them. So on the next slide, our laboratory testing indicates again, about 61% or roughly six out of every 10 fentanyl pills tested contain a potentially lethal dose of fentanyl. And remember, there are no regulations that are on these pills. Fentanyl is literally being added to other products and mixed up and pressed into pills. And the analogy that, you know, that we like to, to make for people is think of mixing and baking. So how many of you out there are, you know, like to, you know, bake cookies and in particular chocolate chip cookies, right? Um, and so think of that batter with chocolate chip, chocolate chips in them. And you do your best, right, to get the chocolate chips evenly throughout your batter, but you never get it absolutely precise so that it's three chocolate chips per cookie. It just never works out that way. And so when the cookies come out, obviously some cookies will have more chocolate chips in them than others. And so that's the kind of analogy you need to be thinking of when you're thinking about these fake pills and how they're being pressed. There's no telling if the pill contains a trace amount, a lethal dose, or twice the lethal dose of fentanyl. On the next slide, um, you know, as I mentioned, two milligrams, that's considered the potential lethal dose. These are some figures from just over the last four or five years or so. Today, the average dose in the pills tested at our DEA labs around the country is 2.4 milligrams. Obviously that's over the lethal dose. That's an increase from just two years ago. And that's an even further increase from four years ago when it was below the lethal dose, right? At 1.6. So there you can see where this trend in lethality has taken us over the last several years. On the next slide, you'll see some of the more common fake pills. Um, they're made to look like prescription opioids such as oxycodone, hydrocodone, um, Xanax, stimulants like amphetamines such as Adderall. These fake pills are widely accessible and they're often sold on social media and e-commerce. And who has, you know, who has the, the means and the access to, uh, to these drugs? It's anybody with one of these. Anybody with a smartphone can actually get these drugs because that's where right now, um, the drug traffickers and people seeking out these drugs are, are finding them. So time for a little bit of a pop quiz. On the next slide, I've got two pictures for you. Um, there's, uh, this is some Oxy. So which one do you think is the real Oxy and which one do you think is the fake Oxy? I'm not gonna play the 30 second think music from Jeopardy. You're not gonna get that long. Uh, I will tell you, uh, if you'd click next for me, uh, Shannon, the real oxy is on the top. Um, and this is a little bit of a, uh, a challenge for people. I mean, even the chemists in our labs are having very, very difficult time um, determining which ones are fake. People are often faked out, pun intended, by the fact that the bottom one is the fake oxy because it looks so crisp, doesn't it? It looks clean, it looks pristine, um, but actually uh, the real oxy is the one on top. Uh, okay, another one. On the next slide is Xanax. So which one do you think is real and which one do you think is fake? Okay, five seconds, your time is up. Uh, and if you go ahead and click it for me, uh, again, the real one is on top and the fake is on the bottom. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is these fake pills, they appear nearly identical to the legitimate prescription medications. Um, the drug traffickers, they are preying on our dependence on pills they will market certain products as legitimate medications when they contain none of the active ingredients of those medications. And I am sure someone will ask the question, why would the drug traffickers want to kill off their customers? And the fact is they don't care. And the reason they don't care, it's all about profit, it's all about money. And unfortunately in our country, we know the demand is high for these types of substances. And so the traffickers are thinking it's okay if they kill off a bunch of their customers because they've got a bunch more customers coming in right behind them. So, um, you know, it's an unfortunate um, state of affairs, but is, it is the reality uh, of what we are faced in. I'm gonna show you the next couple of pictures about what these labs look like. So medical grade fentanyl is made in a clean controlled laboratory, just like this one with strict regulations and of course, medical grade fentanyl is taken in hospitals or nursing homes under strict 
medical care, but we aren't talking about medical grade fentanyl. On this next slide, we're talking about illicit fentanyl that is made in places like jungles and warehouses and garages. There is no quality control in these operations. This, these are photos from uh, an actual illicit fentanyl lab uh, taken in a uh, jungle. There is also no regard for human life, as I mentioned, and there's no telling how much fentanyl is going to end up in one pill. On the next slide, is, you know, we talk about the additional threat. And in prevention, right, for those of you who've been in prevention for you know, as long as I have, and hopefully you, you've been studying your prevention science, we know that access and availability are two of the predominant drivers of, you know, in, in the work that we do in prevention. Try to restrict access and try to restrict availability. Well, social media sites that are popular with youth and young adults to share their stories and pictures, right? And we know which ones I'm talking about. They have also become popular platforms for drug trafficking organizations who use these sites to sell their illicit drugs. On the next slide, um, you'll see some of the emoji codes that are being used. Um, and they, there's this whole language of emojis on social media to communicate about selling and buying these drugs. And we actually have a, a fact sheet on this, and I'll point you to where you can find it um, later on. So if you're monitoring for suspicious text messages on social media or on cash app posts, uh, you know, this could spark a very important and life-saving conversation. We at DEA are working with social media and internet companies to provide them with information to, to help them better understand how dangerous drug traffickers are operating within their space. So that brings us to One Pill Can Kill on the next slide. We launched this in uh, the fall of 2021 when we had first issued that uh, public safety alert about the four out of 10, uh, which I remember I told you is now up to six out of 10. And this at its most basic level is a campaign to raise awareness uh, about the dangers of illicit fentanyl and fake pills. If you go to dea.gov slash one pill, there you can see uh, all of the public safety alerts. I point you particularly to the partners toolbox section of the website. There you can download at no cost all of the different fact sheets the, the graphics that you can use in your communities, in your schools, in your workplaces, a lot of them have extra space on those graphics for you to tailor them however you want. Uh, we encourage you to do that with your local resources, add them to what we have provided. There's also social media messaging that you can use. The emoji code uh, fact sheet is there. If you can't find it, you're gonna see my email information at the end of this presentation. Feel free to drop me a line. I can point you directly to where it is. On the next slide, um, this will get to the universal message that I and others at DEA are continuing to promote. So no matter what audience we are talking to, whether I'm talking to elementary school, middle school, high school, college students, prevention professionals on campus, in the communities, in the workplace, here's the universal message. Never take any medicine that has not been prescribed by your licensed provider and dispensed through a trusted pharmacy. That is the universal message. It applies to everyone, absolutely everyone. Yes, Jill, I see your older adults as well. Again, it doesn't matter the population. Never take any prescription medicine unless it's been prescribed by a licensed provider and dispensed through a trusted pharmacy. Um, on this last slide, I said, uh, you'll see my uh, contact information as, long, as well as our main number. Uh, I've seen several uh, queries as to whether or not the slide deck will be shared. Absolutely, I do know that they're going to uh, send the slide deck out so everybody will get this. So if you don't capture it right now with a screenshot, you'll be able to catch it later. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, speed read through my uh, presentation. I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Beth from ONDCP. Thank you, Rich, and, and thank you. I especially um, I think it's so important that you showed um, all the uh, the pills so that people can see. They really do look just uh, so unbelievably authentic. Um, so again, uh, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, quite a scary time that we're in. Um, I want to just start by saying that the White House does not have access to the chat. So if you are sending me a, a message in the chat or think I'll see your message in the chat, I won't 
you can write it, but it doesn't get to me. Um, so I apologize in advance, but um, I'm not ignoring you. Uh, I also want to let you know that um, the resources that I mentioned today, I provided to our hosts, and they'll be able to send them out to you, all the links. Um, so since I can't do that with no chat, um, they will be happy to do it for me. Um, and I don't have a slide presentation, but at the end, when I get to the end, I really, I'm going to show you a website um, that I really think is important for everyone to know about. So let me start by saying that um, the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy is responsible for developing and implementing the President's National Drug Control Strategy. And within that strategy, there are a set of public health chapters that focus on prevention, primary prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery. And today we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about primary prevention and overdose prevention that are highlighted in these public health sections. And so let me start with some primary prevention. And um, as many of you are probably familiar with the Drug-Free Communities Program, which is housed within ONDCP. And this is a primary prevention program that funds community-based coalitions that engage in multiple sectors of community to prevent youth substance use. And the DFC program provides grants of up to $125,000 per year for five years to community coalitions to strengthen the infrastructure among local partners and create and sustain reduction in local youth substance use. And after five years, these community coalitions can recompete for another five year cycle. Um, and the DFC coalitions, they really do work at the community level to find solutions that help to identify and resources for use um, at risk for substance use. And you know, they are, these are evidence-based programs and you know, we're growing the number of coalitions every day. And the folks that participate at the community level are community leaders. Um, they're also youth, parents, businesses, media, schools, youth organizations, law enforcement, and others. But this really is this community-led effort because we know that every community is different. They have different needs. And really, in order to be successful, we have to recognize uh, the value of the community and recognizing that they have individual needs. Another area um, that seeks to uh, help with primary prevention is the high-intensity drug trafficking areas. And this is a public safety, public health collaboration. And these are located in states. And right now, the HIDA, as they're called, um, has a national prevention strategy. And it serves as an infrastructure for guiding existing prevention programming, as well as nurturing new growth and development in prevention in these HIDA communities. And they have three goals, to establish prevention strategies in all the HIDA regions, use assessments and research to guide prevention, and that's key, making sure that we're using evidence-based um, solutions and prevention efforts, and to sustain prevention strategies in all these areas. Um, and one resource funded to support the prevention strategies is ADAPT, a division for the advancement of prevention and treatment, and it serves as a training and technical systems provider to support the HIDA programs um, on substance use prevention. And like the DFCs, this is again an initiative at the community level that really helps to identify the needs of the community and what they seek and what will work best for them. In addition um, to that work that happens directly at ODCP, we also collaborate um, with our federal agencies, such as Health and Human Services, Department of Education, DEA, to name a few, and to support their efforts in prevention and help move them forward. So let me talk a little bit now about overdose prevention. Um, you know, as we've heard from our previous speakers, uh, fentanyl is incredibly lethal. Uh, it's deadly and, you know, making sure that we can prevent overdose is key because we can't help someone um, whose life we can't save. So um, ONDCP has worked with the Department of Education on a series of webinars. The first three webinars, which were available um, in September, uh, in August, right at the beginning of the school year of 2022, um, are they called Lessons from the Field, and they focused on prevention and treatment resources for school districts. These are all archived, and you will be able to receive um, the link to them uh, from our uh, webinar organizers. And these really laid out 
what resources are available to school communities um, in terms of prevention, in terms of funding, in terms of resources, uh, so that they can embrace these and you know, make them work for their school districts. There's a second set of webinars, and they aired earlier this year, and their primary focus was fentanyl. The first one was knowing facts about fentanyl, and it focused on what is a synthetic opioid and the lethality of fentanyl, counterfeit pills. It talked about a lot of things that Rich talked about. How do you treat an overdose? How do you identify an overdose? Um, and really a discussion of the disproportionate impact of fentanyl on young people. We know that young people are especially um, susceptible to uh, taking a counterfeit pill and dying from a fentanyl overdose. The second webinar in the series, the fentanyl series, focused on preventing and addressing fentanyl use and featured school nurses and other school officials talking about the roles they can and do play in preventing fentanyl use among their students. And this one really, as the other, um, the two of them really had both folks that are actually doing this work on the ground. So providing examples, talking about their experience, talking about how they were able to implement uh, these uh, different programs and initiatives in their schools, which was critically important. Also, about a month ago, uh, the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, uh, Dr. Rahul Gupta, and the secretary of the U.S. Department of Education, Secretary Cardona, had a town hall, and it featured folks who were actually at the ground level in school districts and how they were dealing with the fentanyl crisis. Um, this is also archived um, at the Edu Department of Education website, and it really talked about the experience of these school leaders and social workers and nurses and how they addressed uh, naloxone and overdose in their schools, what kind of pressures they felt, how did they overcome them. So an incredibly great learning tool um, for anyone seeking some uh, lessons from the field, right, from um, school districts themselves. And we also know um, that it's important to have naloxone. Naloxone is the overdose antidote, and it literally saves lives. We know that it should be available and ready at all times, and this means we know it should be in schools, it should be in homes, places like concerts, um, and any places that we know that people are using drugs. ONDCP has been working to ensure that naloxone is available at the site of every overdose. We've been working with SAMHSA on store grant funding that can be used by states for naloxone purchases. FDA made it easier for community organizations to purchase naloxone. And in April, FDA made one of the naloxone brands non-prescription, which means you can, you'll be able to get it over the counter likely um, right before the school year begins uh, at the end of the summer. And yesterday, Dr. Gupta held a meeting with the naloxone manufacturers, and the focus of the area were three, access, communication, and tracking. And we know we talked with all the manufacturers about access to naloxone, ensuring that folks who need it can get it, making sure that naloxone isn't something that's hard to reach, especially um, in areas we know that people are at high risk or where people are feeling stigmatized um, and that naloxone might, people might think, oh, your child is using drugs. So you know, that's why you're purchasing naloxone. So how can we work with manufacturers to increase access and lower barriers? And tied together with that is communication. How are we communicating? How are we talking about naloxone? How are we going to message um, to everyone that naloxone is available and that it saves lives and it's safe. The final one is tracking. So data is a key to almost everything we've been talking about today and making sure that we have the data so that we can make prevention services, other services, um, and naloxone uh, available in the areas that need it most requires data. You know, if you think about, you know, our early times of COVID, you could look on your smartphone, um, as Rick showed us before, your smartphone, uh, and you could know every day how many people uh, were in the hospital with COVID. You knew how many people had died of COVID. Um, and the time lag was, you know, maybe 24, 48, 36 hours. We don't know, we don't have that kind of data on overdoses. And a 
especially on non-fatal overdoses. And we know that non-fatal overdoses are an indicator of a future fatal overdose. We also know that overdoses um, can predict if there's a bad batch of something in a particular community. So at ONDCP, we have created a non-fatal overdose dashboard, um, and it's populated by uh, EMS data. And we're looking to expand that. And partnering in that with um, the manufacturers of naloxone is important. So we know where the naloxone is going and we can help to track and make sure it's going uh, to the places that it needs to be. So access, communication, and tracking, all important things that ONDCP is working on uh, with the naloxone manufacturers. Finally, let me talk about two campaigns that we've been working on with the Ad Council. Uh, the first campaign focuses on influencers. So we know how important it is that to convey a message and have that message land where you want it, um, it should be delivered by a trusted messenger. And my trusted messenger is not always the same as your trusted messenger, certainly not the trusted messenger of my children, maybe your children, or our parents. Um, and so we started creating um, a social media campaign to reach young adults, youth and young adults, uh, with influencers. So young people who have a wide range of followers on social media. And we've been able to identify the ones that, that reach our target audiences, so the folks that we want to convey. And these messages seek to convey the dangers of fentanyl, uh, why you should carry fentanyl, and how to obtain, I'm sorry, <laughs> fentanyl is amazing, um, naloxone. So convey the dangers of fentanyl, the need to carry naloxone, and um, how to obtain naloxone. So that is one of our um, campaigns. Not something I can show you because um, I probably don't follow any of these influencers, but these messages are, are going across the country and have been well received through the data we've seen to date. The second one, and I will ask if somebody can pull up, there we are, the real deal on Sentinel. So this is an incredibly helpful website. This has not only information on Sentinel, so lots of what Rich showed you before, but actually talks about, and could you click on uh, reducing the risk? Um, reducing the risks of Sentinel. And it's all, again, targeted to young people. It's very easy to read. It's easy to absorb. Um, easy to understand for all of us, actually. Um, it has messages about helping your friends. Um, how can you help your friends? Um, it gives tips for that. So there's lots of links throughout the entire website. Um, and finally, let me point you to the lessons section. Um, in the lessons section, there are actual uh, vignettes, if you will, um, and lessons learned. And it's a whole series of lessons um, taught at a school level. Um, so giving the, uh, the idea that, um, that this is a school setting. And the lessons are taught by people who are, are former drug dealers. And they talk about you know, some of the things that Rich mentioned, um, you know, you know, how they you know, brought drugs into their community and you know, you know, who they were selling to and how, and you know, the real, actually, you know, really what was going on. Um, and it gives a good perspective for students to understand because they don't know what they're buying off the internet and they don't know where their drugs are coming from. Uh, so this is an incredible tool. Um, it's available online. Anybody can access it. Again, um, the, uh, the link will be available to everyone uh, to log in. But again, a, a lot of content here, um, which is easily consumable um, and really like strikes a chord with everyone. So at that, I will close and uh, wait for your questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Now I'd like to move into the Q&A section uh, of this webinar. Uh, we have some questions in um, the chat that I will uh, address. And while I'm moving to that, I'll just answer a few quick ones that were asked multiple times. Unfortunately, there is not a uh, certificate for this webinar. 
But the good news is uh, the PowerPoint will be sent to all of um, the participants. We will be sending those out uh, later, probably within the next week or so. Uh, first question that I will pull up. Pardon me. Um, why? Hold on one second here. Having a bit of a challenge viewing the chat. Okay, here's one. Here in South Dakota, hey, South Dakota, uh, we don't seem to be seeing the same issues with heroin and synthetic opioids as other areas, even for people with a history of prescription opioid misuse or abuse. Um, drugs of choice are overwhelmingly, pardon me, and I lost the question. So in essence, um, I guess this is a question for Beth and or Rich. Um, in South Dakota, they're not seeing um, some of the same issues that we're seeing uh, nationwide and just wanted to get your uh, feedback on that. Well, I would just jump in real quick and say, um, you know, I have to give a shout out for the strategic prevention framework, right? So hopefully the vast majority of you on this call know about the SPIF and you're using the SPIF uh, in your work. You're right. Um, not every community, not every state, not every campus, not every school are going to see at the level of different drugs and the type of drug and the amount of drug. Um, you have to follow what your data are showing you. That's the whole point of doing an assessment. So hopefully that's happening in the schools or in the community or across the state. Uh, one of my favorite mantras is that data drives programming. Um, and so doing those assessments, um, that's going to give you the snapshot of where you should be placing your efforts. So thank you, South Dakota, for the question. Um, you may not be seeing the same level of fentanyl that Others might be seeing it. You know, your issues might be more around heroin or cocaine or marijuana. I mean, it's just, um, you know, you're going to need to rely on your survey data to to give you the indication of where you should be placing your efforts. And Beth, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to that. Sure. Uh, thank you. Yes, um, there are different parts of the country that are seeing, um, you know, different. Uh, drug use um, in any given time. And that's the importance of actually having a community-based approach. Because even within a particular state, different communities have different issues that they have to work with. So this community-based approach is so important. Um, and I think SAMHSA, and I like to hand it over to um, Kat and Finn, because SAMHSA has done a really good job, especially through the, um, the, the substance use block grants mental health block grants and the other, the SOAR grants um, in allowing states to figure out what it is that they need um, to address. So I'll just turn it back to Captain Pham. Yeah, um, a lot of our grants, we have um, and some primary prevention grants, the, the SPIF um, PFS, the SPIF uh, that Rich uh, Lucy has uh, referred to, um, allows the communities to actually look at their data and see um, what what uh, substances are being misused in certain areas? Um, you're right. Some areas the the concern are are the opioids, um, prescription drugs, and other areas it could be stimulants um, or or marijuana. Um, so it really depends on the the locality, and even and even with um, opioid overdoses. Um, 
not all communities have the same rate of overdoses. Um, so we really do rely on states and their local communities to look at their data and see where those hotspots are and targeting some of the, the naloxone saturation um, to, to those areas. Um, we have been in communication with states in regarding naloxone saturation and trying to help states figure out, um, you know, and providing resources and technical assistance and helping them figure out um, where those underserved communities are, where those hotspots are, and then targeting um, their resources to those areas. Great. So next question, is there evidence that public presentations to community members about the effects and dangers of fentanyl reduces overdose death from fentanyl? So I can say that I have not seen um, a research specifically related to this. I can say that in my 35 some odd years, um, we've never seen so much data and research have, as we have had over the past few years with COVID. Um, and I mean research into the, the substance use space. Uh, so the research sometimes is slow to come along. Uh, we do know that uh, to save a life, um, naloxone is a key lifesaver um, and that it should be at the site of every overdose. And so it's incredibly important to saturate communities um, that are at high risk with naloxone so that they can save the lives. But um, I have not seen this research yet on this in particular with fentanyl, um, but in trying to use strategies that will help to raise awareness um, and bring attention to the matter is always important. Okay. Next question. Can someone speak to xylazine and fentanyl drug mixtures? Well, certainly the, the DEA labs are, are seeing that. Um, xylazine at the moment is not a controlled substance. Um, uh, it's, it may be heading in that direction. Uh, there is some information about xylazine on our website. Um, and for people that don't know, it's a horse tranquilizer, plain and simple. That's basically what it is. It's used as a veterinary uh, medicine for, for large animals, uh, particularly horses. Um, but yeah, we are hearing, you know, we're hearing from communities and states all over the, the country that they are hearing reports of xylazine in their communities and such. Um, it's not that yet pervasive in what's being seized and seen in the labs. Um, but it is certainly on our radar screen. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, definitely got our eye on it. Uh, and it looks like, you know, it could be heading down the, the scheduling path. Uh, it's not there yet. Um, but certainly you can go online and, you know, on our site. Uh, and there's some information there about it. Yeah. And if I could add, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Fan. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and the scheduling of xylazine does take a while. We're also taking, uh, keeping an eye on that. And uh, the, one of the main things about xylazine is that, especially the, the wound um, uh, that can evolve by taking a substance with xylazine. So um, infections and, and wound care is highly important. Um, we do get a lot of questions in regards to um, the xylazine test strips and about coverage. Um, that uh, we, on a, on a case by case basis, we are looking to, to cover uh, xylazine test strips uh, from, with our grants. So that that is definitely an option. Uh, go ahead, Beth. So in April, under um, the authority of ONDCP in the White House, uh, Director Gupta declared xylazine fentanyl adulterated with uh, xylazine an emerging threat. And that means that uh, we are required to produce a report with a strategy to address it. Um, and so that work is underway right now. Um, and so you can anticipate that uh, in the very near future, there will be a, a report with a strategy to, uh, to address the xylazine issue, specifically um, the synthetic opioids uh, uh, adulterated with xylazine. Okay, uh, one more question that I'll ask, which was, 
Are the campaigns mentioned evidence-based or part evidence-based interventions? Um, Marion, um, the question seems rather generic or general uh, when they say, you know, the campaign. So if we're talking about, for example, the awareness campaign that I mentioned, One Pill Can Kill, which often, which also I think speaks to the previous question. Um, we know from research and prevention research and even uh, your contractor, Vanguard Communications, could produce a lot of this research that's out there. We know that public health campaigns are effective. We know that raising awareness, like the One Pill Can Kill campaign is designed to do, is one of the first steps in educating the general public as well as specific populations about a particular issue. Just myself, as we we're getting back to in-person conferences, right, and exhibits and meetings and such, I, I cannot tell you the number of times I've heard from people across all walks of life, all different settings, they had no idea. That's how often we hear. And so they are, you know, we are doing as much as we can to raise that awareness. So absolutely, um, you know, it is having that impact because that's what we need to be doing first is educating ourselves and our community members. But there's plenty of research to show that public health campaigns certainly do work. Great. Thank you, Rich. And with that, I noticed that we are at time. Uh, this was great. Thank you to, uh, thank you for all of the questions. Thank you to Captain Fan, Beth, and Rich. Um, and most importantly, thank you for joining us for this webinar. Have a great day.